Hi, I'm Senator Malcolm Roberts, and I'm in Brisbane, Australia, and I'm interviewing uh, Professor Ian Plymer, one of the world's most famous geologists and most competent geologists and climate scientists. I'll just go through his qualifications. He's an Australian geologist, Professor Emeritus of Earth Sciences at the University of Melbourne, previously a Professor of Mining Geology at the University of Adelaide. Actually, also, uh, Professor Plymer, you were also at the uh, University of Newcastle, weren't you? I was at University of Newcastle, Professor there, Professor at University of Melbourne, and Professor at the Ludwig Maximilians Universität in München, Germany. I sent you a copy of the cross-examination of Syro's climate case. I have a copy of it. You've, you've read it? Let's yes, just ask you a few basic questions. You're a polymath and, and you're aware of what's going on. So do you think that the CSIRO has demonstrated unprecedented temperature change? They've demonstrated unprecedented ignorance uh, by not looking at the past. Do you think the Marcotte paper that they rely on demonstrates unprecedented temperature and unprecedented rate of temperature change? Now, try not to laugh about Marcotte, please. Exactly the same. Uh, you cannot look at one second in a year and say that's how the whole year worked. And this is what uh, the Markov paper does. It looks at a very narrow period of time rather than trying to say, fit that narrow period of time into, into what has happened throughout the history of the planet. And again, the same errors, you're not looking at it in context with the history of time. Do you think that Harry's paper demonstrates that human carbon dioxide caused the temperature variation they tried to claim? No, because we have far greater temperature variations in the past when humans weren't on planet Earth. Secondly, uh, we've got plenty of time of human habitation on planet Earth to look at, and during those periods of time, we don't see evidence that humans have changed temperature at all, despite the fact we had a minor industrialisation in Roman times. And all we see from the Roman industrialisation is a little bit of lead from Iberia in the ice of Antarctica and Greenland. But uh, we, we do not see the effect of humans on climate. And, and Harry's used intervals that are so far apart that today's uh, carbon dioxide increase in the last, what, 70 years... Uh, just wouldn't be captured in, in, in what he did. No, exactly right. And again, this comes back to measurement. What are you measuring it? Why are you measuring it? How are you measuring it? What are the orders of accuracy? And how does that fit into a bigger time scale? And you can very easily pick a group of temperature measurements and where you start at a certain point, you can say, oh, you know, we're, we're heating up. Or you can pick another point somewhere on the, on the, on the plot and say, oh, we're cooling down. It depends upon where you start and where you finish. Professor Plymer, did CSIRO do enough to answer my question and prove its claim? Oh, no, CSIRO were trying to browboot you. They were trying to use a very, very small amount of information uh, to, to shut you up. Now, I know you well enough to know that they can't shut you up, so stick with it. Oh, we will be. Did, si did the CSIRO provide enough evidence to de-industrialise Australia and the West? Oh, not at all. Not at all. Uh, I mean, if you, if you want to deindustrialize Australia, let's start with deindustrializing the CSIRO. The CSIRO stands for the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation, and it was set up where scientific research could actually add to Australia's industrial competitiveness. It wasn't set up to destroy Australia's industry. So if you want to destroy a process, then... Maybe they should look at themselves first. But um, there were divisions of the CSIRO, and I sat on the advisory committee of various CSIRO divisions, which made great discoveries. Uh, one I think of is discovery of um, submarine sulphide metal deposits in the Manus Basin. This was a prize-winning group of the CSIRO. They got disbanded. At the same time, the CSIRO started to appoint sociologists to every division to be able to promote the societal benefit of this research. I'm sorry, they've lost their way. Right. Now, C CSIRO admitted that they have never said that carbon dioxide from human activity is a danger. And they said they never will say that. So I asked them, where did these politicians who say that CSIRO got that uh, to them, where did they get it from? And they said, well, you'll have to ask the politicians. 
The second thing Syro admit, as admitted was that today's temperature, this was after us cross-examining them, they admitted, they, they broke down and admitted that today's temperatures are not unprecedented. Yet global warming was the precursor to climate change, and that was all about unprecedented global warming. So, I mean, the Syro has under, 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 uh, mined its own case. Then they said, but the rate of temperature change currently going on is is unprecedented. What about the, is it the Dansgaard Oshka uh, period of warming? What about well, other? Period? I get very suspicious when someone uses the word unprecedented. Um, in the past, we have seen cycles of climate. Now, we have uh, massive climate changes on the tectonic scale, which is about every 400 million years. Every 143 million years, we have a wrong address in the galaxy and we get bombarded by cosmic radiation, get more clouds, cool down. And there are some pretty strong correlations between major ice ages and having a bad galactic address. And this has been validated using the coherence criterion by isotopic work done by a prominent Israeli uh, geochemist. We then have um, cycles of climate, depending upon whether we're close or further away from the sun. And these are orbital cycles. These have been known for a very long period of time. And these Milankovitch cycles uh, can drive um, our current glacials and interglacials. Then we have solar cycles, and the, the sun is not stable. It has cyclical changes. It's quite variable, and these changes are 1,500 years, 217 years, 87 years, 22 years. These cycles we can measure. And then we have bigger scales of cycles. We're not quite sure of these, but these are the grand solar maximum and grand solar minimum, which we're approaching now. So we have solar cycles. Then we have lunar tidal cycles, which every 18 and a half years push warmer water into the Arctic. Uh, <coughs> then we have oceanic decadal oscillations in the Atlantic and the Pacific. These are about 60 years. And in fact, the ancient Chinese calendar was on a 60-year cycle, and that was clearly related to what they observed happening in the ocean and with crop harvests and crop failures. So <clears throat> planet Earth is cyclical. When some of these cycles overlap, we will, might get a rapid change. If a few of them overlap, we'll get a very rapid change. So it, since our last glaciation, we've had sea level changes. We can measure what's happening to sea surface temperature because there are floating critters that make a shell out of calcium carbonate. They are single-celled organisms. The carbon and the oxygen in these shells, we can isotopically measure, and from experimental work, we can work out what the temperature of the sea surface was. And they're accurate thermometers down to 0 0.1 degrees Celsius. And so we see these cycles of temperature in the oceans. When these critters die, the shells drop onto the ocean floor, uh, ocean floor drilling has pulled out all these sediments and each layer by layer by layer, we can start looking at cycles of temperature change. These cycles are given names and numbers. The prominent ones are given names after prominent uh, paleoclimatologists and others are given really exciting names like 5E or 3B. And these changes we see, and as we get... Further and further back into the past, it's harder to see these tiny cycles. But in fairly modern materials, such as in the last 10,000 years or 20,000 years, you can see these cycles very easily. So we live on a planet that is constantly changing. Most of these changes are cyclical. Every now and then you get something that isn't in a cycle, and that's when you might get whacked by a dirty big asteroid. But we can start now understanding the way climates change based on cycles. And this is very exciting because it gives you the ability to make predictions. And these are based on the past, not on trace gases where the measurement process and the models are highly dubious.